Okay, welcome back. We're talking about first-time guests. Now, this is the last session that we're gonna do on first-time guests, and it is slightly shorter than the others because I want, at the end of this session, for you to review all that we've talked about because we started by trying to get into the mind of a first-time guest and what is going on in their life on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning before they come to church. Then we looked at how to move them from the street to the seat in those four areas of greeted, directed, treated, and seated. And then last time we got into what happens during the service and we looked at that all-important connection card. And we're gonna pick back up with that connection card in this session. But we also looked at what happens as they walk out of the service. And hopefully by now you've got your free book in place, something that you're giving your first time guest. You're studying that connection card script. You've thought through that resource area and what needs to be there in order to provide that welcoming environment and answer the questions of your first time guest. But now in this session, what we wanna look at is, okay, what happens post weekend? So the first time guest has gone back home, but your work continues. So you now have these connection cards. You've sorted through and you've pulled out your first time guest cards and you wanna handle those properly. In fact, I want you to see every first time guest as a gift from God. And how can you treat that gift appropriately? So what I wanna give you in your notes is a follow-up process. So if you see, post weekend, we're focusing on follow-up. And Sunday afternoon or Monday, you wanna start this follow-up process. So let me give you four thoughts on follow-up. Number one, build a first response team. Build a first response team. This is a team of people that will help you in doing this follow-up because you've got data entry to do. You wanna take these cards and you wanna put them into your church database software and for recommendations on church software, see the resources that go along with this uh, seminar. Now, at first, you may be the first response team. You know, for many years at the journey, I was the first response team. And then I had somebody else who helped me with that, an office manager, and then eventually another pastor. But then over time, we did build a volunteer team that would help in a lot of these areas that we're going to talk about. But for now, maybe it's just you. But as we uh, build through this system and build through this process that we're looking at, perhaps you can recruit other people to help you along the way but you wanna build that first response team. And the first response team does a lot of important work, but one of the most important things that they do is they pray for each of your first time guests. And so if you remember, I talked about that sort of spiritual creativity that you might have of you've got a first time guest card and you look at their name, you look at where they might live, you look at their occupation, you look at how they heard, you look at if you have a husband's card and a, and a wife's card that goes together, or maybe you've got a children's check-in card on someone. And then you begin to pray for that family or pray for that person, or maybe they literally shared a prayer request with you on the back of that connection card. So one of the, the key spiritual elements to the first response team is prayer. And then there are elements that you wanna use that team or you wanna do personally. And the, the first thing you wanna do as a first response team is actually the second area of follow-up. And so number two is 36 hour follow-up via email. 36 hour follow-up via email. Now, you'll notice the precision of this. Within 36 hours of their first attendance at the journey, I want to send them an email. And you know, everybody has an email now. And they've been saying for years that email is gonna go away, but we still see that, you know, young and old, they all have email. It's just a requirement in our day, almost as much as having a phone number. You've gotta have an email address. So one of the easy and convenient and non-imposing ways that you can follow up with someone is get the email address from the connection card and send your first time guest an email. And, and for me, this is a very simple email. People love short emails anyway. But it's, hey, Jose, thank you so much for being at the journey on Sunday. I hope you had a great experience. I wanted to let you know that uh, we'll be praying for you this week and we want you to come back. P.S. In a couple of days, I have a meeting to talk about how things went on Sunday, I would love if you would complete this 30 second survey, click this link below. And in that email, I not only thank them for coming, I invite them back, 
I might say something personal if they shared a prayer request or if I know if it's a husband and wife or if I know they had someone in our kids' ministry. I, I do a little research about the person before I send them the email. But one of the key elements of that email is I drive them to fill out what we call a 30-second survey. And this is a web link. And if you remember, I told you in with the free book that we give, basically is the same email in a letter form, more generic, of course, because I don't know their names at that time. But also in that free book is a flyer asking them to go complete the 30-second survey. And, you know, sometimes I find that someone doesn't fill out a connection card on Sunday, but they still take the free book, which I allow. I'm fine to give away the free books. We're not checking IDs or checking connection cards against the free books. But sometimes they'll fill out the survey even if they don't fill out a connection card, and then I will get their information from the survey. But in this case, I've got their card, and I'm now asking them to fill out the survey. Now, we have samples of those surveys in with the resources. Just look for the first-time guest survey, but I can tell you it's very simple. It's, it asks for their confirmation of their name and their email. It asks for some basic contact info, very simple. And then we ask, what did you notice first? What did you like best? Overall impression? And how can we pray for you? And basically, that's, that, that survey has been the same over and over and over because I've just not been able to improve on it. You'll notice I don't ask, what did you not like? There's no reason to ask that. If something went terribly wrong, they would tell you an overall impression. But I don't want them to be nitpicky. I don't want them to reinforce any minor thing that may have gone wrong. Plus, I found that if someone is not a regular church attender, they don't really know how to give feedback. And so that question may even lead to their not filling out the survey. But what did you notice first? We noticed how clean the parking lot was. We noticed the friendly greeters. We noticed the person who welcomed us at the children's check-in. What did you like best? Oh, we really liked the music. Or when I teach, they always say, the teacher was so great and profound and full of wisdom. And well, they hardly ever talk about the teaching, honestly. It's usually about the music. And then, you know, what was your overall impression? Oh, we liked it. We've been looking for a church. We, we want to come back. How can we pray for you? And sometimes in that survey question, they will tell you some of the most serious personal prayer requests that you can imagine. Pray for us. This is our last hope before we go to divorce court. Or pray for me, I'm dealing with the loss of a mother. I took care of her for the last decade and I just don't know what to do now that she's gone. You wouldn't think on a small survey like that that someone would share these intimate prayer requests, but many, many times people do. And what that does is that gives me now an open door to be their pastor, to serve them in a way that goes beyond just that first time attendance. And then when I get those surveys back, I may choose to call, I may choose to arrange an appointment or whatever might be needed. But if nothing else, they take a step of engagement telling me about their experience. And I do all of that through that email. But I send out the email. And I would say 10% uh, of the time, I'll even get a reply to that email. More and more today, people don't reply per se to emails, but I'll see the surveys come in. Some people will write back. I also put a little personal note in the email about who I am and maybe some fun stuff about my life. And sometimes they'll write back and say, oh, we have children of the same age, or oh, I know somebody who went to that school. And you'll see samples of those emails in, with the resources, and you can take that and build your own email. But 36 hours, that, that must go out within 36 hours. I drive that, I watch it, I hold uh, our staff even today accountable to that standard. And then number three is a 96 hour follow-up via mail, post, if you will, snail mail, I guess they call it. So in addition to sending the email, we also send a follow-up note to every person who attends. Now, this note also includes a link to the survey, but here's the catch. It's not a form letter. It's not even a letter. It is a personalized, handwritten note. So what I did is I went out and bought some personal size stationery that you would find in a stationery store or a large discount store. And I, and I bought 25 or 50 little personal envelopes and little personal notes. And I literally hand write a note to every first time guest. So this time, dear Jose, thanks for being my guest at the Journey on Sunday. I hope you had a wonderful experience. I've enclosed a small gift as a token of my appreciation. Hope to see you back soon, Nelson. And these letters go out under the signature written by the person who spoke on Sunday, unless I might have a guest speaker. 
But you as the primary pastor or me as the primary pastor, we write these letters. They go out every week. There is tremendous power in the handwritten note. And I want to seriously challenge you to send a handwritten note to every first-time guest. Of all the things that I talk about in the Assimilation Seminar, the feedback I hear over and over is, when we started doing the handwritten notes, everything changed. Now, a handwritten note is very powerful in any culture. Uh, no matter where you are in the world, the handwritten note is powerful. But in worlds that have gone more high-tech, like we have here in the United States, we've gone high tech and we have social media and we have our phones and we live our lives online. As the world has gone more high tech, certainly you wanna use that. Use email, have them connect with you on social media, do everything that you can in, in step number two, email and beyond. Don't ignore email, but do email and whatever else you wanna to add to it. But don't miss here in number three, this high touch element. You see, as the world has gone more high-tech, you also want to go more high-touch. And less and less are people receiving things in the mail. So when you show up where no one else is showing up with a handwritten note with a live stamp in their mailbox, written clearly by you with a little gift inside of it, and I'll get to that, you really stand out. And I hear from people all the time on a Sunday, I got your note last week. You're the first person that's written me a handwritten card since my birthday. Or sometimes I hear, I didn't even get a birthday card this year. I just got that handwritten note from you. And so this handwritten note is powerful. And I would just dare say that if you are not willing to write the handwritten notes, you are not in a position where God can trust you with more first-time guests. I've had people tell me, we have five first-time guests a week. You really mean that I'm supposed to write five handwritten notes? <laughs> yes. Five, 15, 50. You know, sometimes I start writing them uh, late in the week for the following Sunday. I don't put the name on it yet, but basically what I write is the same. So all I have to do is go in there and put the uh, dear and the salutation and then put the name on the envelope. If you walk into my office, you'll see boxes sometimes of handwritten notes that I've written during downtime or written while waiting on appointments. Or sometimes I've been known to carry those with me on a, a trip and write them on a flight. I was filling out one, one time on a flight and somebody asked me across the seat, did you just get married? Are you writing thank you notes for a wedding? No, it's more important than that. These are first time guests. And so you really should, must, have to, whatever it is, you've got to write these handwritten notes. And the handwritten note is what I call the keystone habit of the assimilation system. If you're willing to do this one little thing, then you're gonna find amazing blessing and, and uh, provision from God for all the other areas that we have talked about and all the future areas that we will talk about. So I'm a fan, as you can tell, of the handwritten note, and you will be too. The feedback will be so phenomenal that you'll never stop doing the handwritten notes. Now, you may have heard me mention that I put a gift inside the handwritten notes. It's a, it's a $5 gift card, and uh, you can choose what the gift card might be. In our locations where people drive cars to the church, we give them a $5 gas card. And I, I think that's a very, very appropriate gift. Everybody uses gas. It symbolically says, we will pay for your gas to come back to our church for the second time. In some of our urban areas, we might give a subway pass or a bus pass, basically the same idea. We'll pay for you to come back for your second visit. Did I just say visit? Okay, I guess visit's okay. It's visitor that's bad. But, you know, other places, sometimes people give restaurant cards or they give coffee cards or different things. I like something very basic, like a gas card, and I would encourage you to test out different options because it has to be something that's very available and something that they would use. You know, if you give them a, a very unique gift card to perhaps a, a dessert place or a restaurant, they may never get around to using it. But I want them to use that gas card. I want them to put it in their car and be reminded that was from the church, and they care about me and build that link in their mind back to our church. So this goes in the mail 30 or 96 hours after their first visit. So the email will often go out on Monday or often go out on Tuesday morning, and then I always get the letter in the mail by Tuesday afternoon, and then it will arrive in people's mailbox generally by Wednesday or definitely no later than Thursday. So there's power in this handwritten note. 
And, and the only objection I ever really hear beyond, do you really want me to write all of these notes? And that's a minor objection. The only objection I ever hear about this is, well, there's a cost involved. Well, yeah, there's a stamp. There, there's, a, there's some stationery involved. No, no, the, the, the card, it's $5. You want me to spend $5? Well, first of all, I don't want you to spend $5. I want you to think of it as an investment in that person that has come to your church. You're investing in them. And you see, God's doing something in their life. They may have seen your ads. They may have seen your signage. They may have invited, been invited by a friend. You've already made an investment to get them there for the first time. Now make a second investment to get them back a second time. You know, we found in just doing some surveys that you may spend $100, $200, or even more to get someone there for the first time. That's the investment you make in evangelism. So then I'm saying you should also invest another 5 or $7 or whatever the total cost of this little package might be to get them to return. It's an investment in them. It's a thank you note for this gift that God has sent to you. So you build the team. You do 36-hour follow-up via email, and the team can help you send out those emails. You do the 96-hour follow-up via mail. You write the handwritten notes. Maybe they put the cards in. They mail it, stamp it, take it to the uh, post office. And then number four, you do a one-month follow-up. And you can do this via mail or email, or my preferred way would be both. This is uh, just a letter that you might send them one month after their first time uh, attendance at your church, acknowledging that it's been a month, acknowledging that you hope they've gotten connected, giving them some invites about upcoming events that you have or an upcoming uh, sermon series or teaching series that you're doing. It's just one little last step in case they haven't come back. Now, if they come back and they've become a second time guest, well, we'll get to that in our next session. But if 30 days after their first visit, they're still listed in your database as a first time guest, then you wanna at least do one more thing to try to get them back. And you can see some samples about this. And if you can't do number four, I don't think it's nearly as important as the first three. And along the way, let me just remind you, continue to pray. Think about ways that you can wow your first time guest, wow them with the handwritten note, wow them with the gift card, wow them with the one month contact and whatever it might be. And remember, if you're faithful with the few, you will be entrusted with more. So you may only have one first time guest a week. Well, make sure 36 hour follow up happens, 96 hour follow up happens, one month follow up happens. Be faithful with that one. Now, there, you may have noticed there, there is a few things that I didn't mention. Uh, for example, I didn't mention phone calls. Um, I'm not a big fan of phone calls to your first time guest. Uh, I do think it's appropriate for you to make phone calls to the first time parents who uh, check in their children at your kid's church or children's church. And uh, in essence, you could take the same follow-up process that we've been building here and layer it onto your student ministry and layer it onto your kid's ministry and adjust as appropriately. That's what we've done. But calling first-time guests, I found, unless they have a serious prayer request that demands a pastoral connection, it, it, it oftentimes just pushes people away and it, it, it sometimes kind of freaks people out. You know, what is a pastor doing calling me? I don't know how to talk to a pastor. I don't know what to do. So this is the minimum that I would do, email and mail. If you want to do something else, then test it. If you want to do something else on social media, test it and see if it works. If you want to make a few phone calls to see what kind of response that you get, test it and see if it works. But I can assure you that the basic email follow-up, the handwritten note, those things work and they will be the best return on your limited time and resources. And I want the response to be fast. I want people to feel like we noticed. Now, I'm also a realist, and I know that even though I do this quick follow-up, they may not come back the next week. In fact, if they're unchurched, they may not come back for two or three weeks or even six or eight weeks. But I still want to do this follow-up, and I want to do the best that I can. As we end this session, there's a lot for you to think about. In fact, uh, you noticed, as I told you, we have invested a significant portion of time on first-time guests. Now, what you will discover as we go into our future sessions is a lot of the seeds that I've planted here in First Time Guest will allow us to cover Second Time Guests quicker and then allow us to cover regular attenders and members much quicker. So by getting this right, 
by getting first contact right, by getting during the service right, by getting post-service right, by getting post-weekend right. It has a tremendous impact on whether or not your first-time guest will return, but the very same systems and processes that you build here can be layered over into second-time guest, and they have a profound impact on moving people from regular attenders to members. So we're gonna pick up with second-time guest in the next section, but I want you to take some time in your teams now to think about your first time guest process. What are some changes you need to make? What are some changes you discussed three sessions back that you were going to make? Have you prayed for your first time guest? Is there someone you need to invite on the team? Decide now to go out and pick up those first time guest stationery and those stamps that you need to start handwriting. Uh, maybe you need to make some database changes. I don't know what it might be, but there's a lot of areas for discussion in this first time guest area. And if you get this foundation right, you'll be able to build, build, and build like we're gonna do in future sessions. So let me leave you with this verse. I've alluded to it a number of times. It's Matthew 25. Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. You have been faithful with your few first time guests. Maybe God says, I will entrust you with more. And if you take care of your first time guest, there's a greater likelihood they're going to come back. And second time guests are probably the single greatest indicator of health and growth inside of your church. But that is for our next session.